Williams, analyzing everyday life through the imminent materialism of Deleuze and Guattari, by David Robert Cole. What is everyday life? The singularity within this question, by degrees this paper, is formed by the conjunction of often simultaneous subjective narrative structures that allow one to explain everyday life in terms of events and occurrences in sequence and the particular objective historical context that one finds oneself embroiled within. And this aspect of everyday life is foregrounded by and through political economics. The idea of everyday life in this paper is henceforth diverted from the structural critique of objective sociology that Henry Lefebvre enacted and aligned with the practice of everyday life as described by Michel de Sauture. Sauture famously stated in order to become embroiled within the practices of everyday life, one should walk around urban areas. And this strategy has resonance within this paper about traffic jams and everyday life, as this tactic predominantly relieves one of car travel. So Chia's practice of thinking about embedded narratives through walking, through walking enables the tactics and strategies of everyday life to come to the fore. And these ideas joined well with Deleuze Guattari's effective politics, as represented in A Thousand Plateau. Everyday life in this paper is a form of reflexive, affective politics. This politics includes art, non-organic life, and thinking through the elements of contemporary existence until one begins to discern the plateau of everyday life as an on-current, reciprocating reality and a potential maelstrom of non-human becomings. I have termed this ingrained and fluvial reality as the petro-citizen. We are all petro-citizens. This statement is true even if we reject the everyday use of cars or if we believe in a green solution to impending environmental catastrophe. The, envi the petro-citizen is not a negative assessment with respect to everyday life. That is a fitting term that sums up some of the most vital elements of becoming involved with everyday life. Populations have been turned into packs of consumers through the economic and governmental processes of the last 25 years. And everything we consume depends in some way on petrol. The thought of traffic jams sits inside of us and creates emotional responses to events, some of which we may be barely aware these responses and sentiments to everyday life are aligned with Deleuze and Guattari's rhizomatics, with pipelines of global capital that have increased the accessibility and proliferation of petrol with subjectivity. The wealth that is being created due to petrol consumption is reinvested in everyday life as parallel and alternate forms of economic activity. The economy is therefore driven and accelerated by petrol and the many other products of oil that we use, for example, plastics. George Bush said we are addicted to oil. This is an underestimation of the connection between subjectivity and oil. The microdynamics of traffic combined with the macro politics of oil is more than an addiction. This more than may be understood through the ways in which the reality of traffic jams transmutes into different behaviours and planes that intersect with and manifest in everyday life. For example, the drive to and from work intersects with feelings of powerlessness, frustration and inability to change circumstances, which is conjunctive with road expansion, car production, satellite towns and the car parks of shopping malls. The petro citizen dutifully consumes petrol by buying their food at the supermarket. They ingest the smell of the fumes that lingers in the air their whole body becomes impregnated with oily substance. The designation of the petro citizen allows us to talk about everyday life in a new way. Such is life as we are now thoroughly riven by oil. This means that our minds are in many ways dictated by oily power concerns, which have been termed as petro politics. The process that this politics determines may be understood as the hollowing out of subjectivity by oil and the replacement of stable character and the self with the actions necessary to keep the economic flows of petrol consumption working. One's actions are packaged and represented as the oscillation between work, leisure 
and the consumptive attitudes that are involved with the petropolitics of the work-leisure range. Television programmes such as Top Gear work in this range, closing down options that are other to the petro plateau, e.g. bohemianism or the flaneur, making the existence of alternative realities to oil seem absurd and irrelevant. Car advertising does a similar job aligning sex, freedom, self-worth and vitality to the petro domain. The petro citizen absorbs all these influences as everyday life. The difference that this paper wishes to communicate can be demonstrated through the opening scene of Jean-Luc Godard's Weekend. The camera pans along the traffic jam and recalls the absurdity and heartbreak of the situation. The cinematography, mo the, this cinemat cinematographic moment allows one to gain insight into the penetrating reality of traffic jams. This film raises consciousness of the ways in which the multiple aspects of traffic jams sit inside of us and determine emotional and rational responses to phenomena long after one has driven clear of the hold-up. To understand this connectivity further, one must delve into the imminent materialism that underpins this paper. A Thousand Plateaus is an integrated philosophical construction. One might say that the plateaus have no start and no end, though one is able to reconstruct their evolution through understanding the influences and intents of the authors. The first point about the plateaus is that they mean to say something important about the unconscious. Deleuze Guattari worked out a means to, to link economics with the unconscious in their first joint book, Anti-Oedipus. This was essentially achieved by closely meshing Freud with Marx and by taking the most non-normative approach possible to this alignment. Anti-Oedipus is a breakthrough text in terms of understanding how the unconscious works on a social and economic plane and because it breaks the stranglehold of Oedipus on the unconscious. Thousand Plateaus goes further than Antiedipus, in that the unconscious is set free from the universal, historically dialectical time of Marx and given specific dates and foci. The focus of this paper is Traffic Jams 2011, and this dis determines a plateau that continually interacts with the unconscious and everyday life. Imminent materialism is here an example of a new materialism. This means that the ways in which one understands materialism is in a state of constant re-evaluation. Thoughts, the imagination and the unconscious are included in this imminent materialist analysis as the restructuring of materialist flows is in a state of constant flux. One could cogently ask about the nature of the real given the mixture of thoughts and actual life that imminent materialism somewhat perilously demarcates. Deleuze answered this question in terms of the careful analysis, synthesis and analysis of everyday life. One isn't interested in everything to do with everyday life, but in the intersections and dynamics of everyday life that emerge in the gaps between the packages of thought and flows of material objects that we can follow. There is a form of chaos theory at work here, yet this theory is mitigated by and blended with philosophy. The precise material mo model of everyday life that one derives according to imminent materialism must say something about agency and politics. Everyday life flows through us, yet is also out there in the world as a combinational matrix that subjugates and divides. Everyday life has started long before we were born and will continue after we are dead, yet everyday life also has a particular reality that we may describe today, or the real. This paper looks to do work in this arena by locating traffic jams and the Petro citizen and putting them into conceptual and theoretical action. The imminent materialism of this paper responds to a vitalist concept of time. This means that the dynamic interactions of everyday life that are formed in the unconscious are extended through time as a vital energy in things. One could say that the ways in which traffic jams affect us determines a form of duration, or durée, which is an accumulating mode of understanding time. Not only does the powerlessness of traffic jams capture one's unconscious, it also stretches and plays with time. The endless repetition of the experience of traffic jams in one's life requires a strict vitalism, which animates the ways in which the contemplation and representation of traffic jams may alter reality. This 
alteration links the imminent materialism of this paper to art and shows how traffic jams can be taken out of context and given new and different life. This connection to artwork also corresponds to the Spinozism that is functioning here, in that representations of traffic jams uncover affect in both the viewer and doer of the art. The effect of traffic jams is a dynamic collision of forces that can set off random and unforeseen events as well as perpetual stuckness. Traffic jams can be dramatic, moving, unearthly and awe-inspiring. In this sense, the traffic jam determines a mode of social production without ownership that one uh, may take from Marx and a plane of imminence that attempts to establish differences in kind. These differences in kind are importantly distinguished from Kantian differences in that the difference that imminent materialism establishes is not involved with transcendence or the subject I. Phenomenology is circumvented through imminent materialism by setting the subject free of its per perceptual bindings. However, at the heart of this unbinding act action, and in order to cope with the dictates of the real in an expanded subject, lies an inevitable confrontation with death. In between the spaces of the traffic jam, both in our minds and in reality, are car crashes. The insertion of car crashes into the imminent materialism of traffic jams brings us closer to the reality of everyday life. The construction of a plane of imminence with respect to the everyday life of traffic jams includes the reality of car crashes. The unconscious is activated at this point as the chaos of non-determinate effects involved with a car crash seeps into consciousness. This thought production could manifest as a sudden panic attack whilst driving or as a certain atmosphere of fear that one might discern as one enters a roundabout or in a car park. Andy Warhol's pink car demonstrates the effect of fear as a suburban family clamber out of their upturned car. One can see a white picket fence behind the car crash which adds to the effect in that the death drive has arrived in familiar suburbia. Everyday life is therefore connected to the death drive and everyday life is, is made other through this piece of art. Pink car has a visceral effect on the viewer in that the ways in which one may perceive are engaged and reversed. That could be you struggling to get out of your car after your next trip to the shops. After viewing this picture, that thought could lodge, lodge itself in your mind every time that you get into your car. The death drive wells up in the mind through car crashes, and this drive is, is a crucial aspect in the construction of the traffic unconscious. The point here is not that imminent materialism consists only of focusing on death, or by revelling in the negative possibilities associated with car travel, but that the imminence of car crashes, as Pink Car demonstrates, communicates an overwhelming and absolute reality. The everyday reality of car crashes is full of material that one may add to the traffic jam plane of imminence. The artists Ben Quilty and Tom McGrath have painted front-on car wrecks. The wreckage of the car is abstracted from con context. One doesn't see anyone struggling to get out of the wreck or where the car has been crashed. The car wreck is therefore a singular object full of its own life and not possessing a clear back narrative or framing story. The point here is that the unconscious consumed by the death drive doesn't necessarily free associate through the contemplation of images to fill in every possibility about their existence. Rather, the objects may take on a life of their own and the car wrecks are allowed to become other through imminent materialism. The application of a thousand plateaus to everyday life concentrates and focuses on the production of the new and gives rise to different realities that define material flows of objects and ideas. In the case of the images of car wrecks, these flows are an amalgam of twisted metal, halted desires, indentation, contortion, ruptures and wounds. The effects that are extracted from the images of car wrecks include the becoming isolated, the becoming dislocated, sorry, of the car crash. The car crash is henceforth bestowed with agency that moves between notions of speed and progress. The car crash is a path to the wrecker's yard, is the place that we are heading when we turn on the transmission. Death haunts the roads, moves through our vehicles, it takes hold of the steering wheel. The car crash is a moment in time as represented by paintings of car wrecks. 
The car crash is also a sequence of moments that has led to the final wreckage. This sequencing can be seen in Andy Warhol's green burning car. However, Warhol plays with our perception of the car crash by repeating and treating the same image. The car burns in different places on the slide and is accompanied by the same two figures, one walking away from the burning car, the other pinned to a tree. One gains the perception that there is action and sequence embedded in these images by the layout. The truth is that Warhol has represented stasis and the immobility of a crash through one burning car. In Deleuzean terms, the green burning car is an example of a time image, wherein movement and time are conjoined in an imagistic framework. This is a quote from Deleuze. There is thus no longer association through a metaphor or metonymy, but re-linkage on the literal image. There is no longer linkage of associated images, but only re-linkages of independent images. Instead of one after the other, there is one image plus another, and each shot is deframed in relation to the framing of the following shot. In Dina uh, Shukit's Zagat, the time image is a collage of an inverted, crippled traffic jam and a rupture point, where an explosion of colour and form represents the suture of a car crash. The painting comes out of the frame and, it, and impresses the reality of the car crash on the viewer. This dynamic framing is a time image, in that the picture is a representation of various shots taken from the perspective of someone watching a car crash. Firstly, the traffic moves along in a traffic jam. A car crash takes place. There is an explosion involved with the crash and pieces of wreckage and flesh fly out of the scene. All the other cars in the traffic jam are now implicated in the crash and crash themselves through inversion. This image is not a metaphor or metonymy for everyday life, but a time image that shows how the pieces of a car crash fit together and relate to one another. According to imminent materialism, one does not interpret the picture and imbue it with altern alternative meanings. Rather, one allows the interrelated material flows to be brought forth and into life through imminence. This process and methodology stems in part from the artistic movements of Surrealism, Dada, Situationist and Constructivism. One can transform everyday objects and create new realities according to the principles of incongruity and surprise. The creative unconscious is employed in terms of creating ready-made artefacts that disrupt normative assumptions with respect to function and form. Hence, a car crash could be known as a broken mechanical flower, a traffic jam, an instance of car sickness. Science fiction movies often blow up cars and traffic jams as a special effect, and this is a particularly effective strategy for disrupting the sense of normality that one might associate with the images. The time image is therefore a flexible and inverting schema for understanding the ways in which car crashes and tra traffic jams represent reality and impinge upon everyday life. This is called uh, The Everyday Life of Petropolitics implies a certain relationship with libidinal forces, which could be expressed through the phrase libidinal carism. People begin to worship their cars. This relationship is loving, fetishized, sexual and intimate. The becoming involved here importantly significa, uh, significa, signifies sorry, a certain process of car modification. One can fit enormous speakers to the back of the vehicle, use the back end of the car for pole dancing, or turns one, one's van into a science fiction transportation device. The focus here is not to dismiss these consequences of libidinal carism as other to the normal relationship that one might want to develop between oneself and one's car, but to understand that these behaviours may be studied and incorporated into the notion of everyday life that this paper is articulating with reference to imminent materialism. In this case, <clears throat> the rubric is that of ethology, or the study of social or organisation from a biological perspective. The whole panoply of petropolitics comes into view at this point, as libidinal forces involved with carism carry with them immense social tendencies and the ways in which life is currently organised. For example, the connection between car advertising, town planning and roads 
creates a landscape through which one is able to study current behaviours and forms of the human pack. One is turned on through car advertising, usually with reference to sex, status or freedom. This energy is henceforth, henceforth packaged and managed through one's use of the car in the town where one lives, i.e. in the drive to work, going to school or in the pursuit of leisure. Finally, this criss-crossing map and trace of one's life may be seen from above in the density of the traffic and in the exact form of the roads upon which one travels every day. The ethology of everyday life is therefore represented through the relationship between car advertising and roads, as well as the becoming and machinery involved with the car, human car modification. The fictional novel that has come closest to an imminent materialism of everyday life and the Petro Citizen is Crash. David Cronenberg made Ballard's hallucinogenic tale into a film, and these pieces demonstrate many of the principles of libidinal carism. Ballard wrote, <clears throat> I looked through the colour photographs of the magazines. In all of them, the motor car, in one style or another, figured as the centrepiece. Pleasant images of young couples in group intercourse around an American convertible parked in a placid meadow. A middle-aged businessman naked with his secretary in the rear set of his Mercedes. Homosexuals undressing each other in a roadside picnic. Teenagers in an orgy of motor motorised sex on a two-tier vehicle transporter, moving in and out of lashed-down cars. And throughout these pages, the gleam of instrument panels, window louvres, the sheen of over-polished vinyl, reflecting the soft belly of a stomach or a thigh, the forests of pubic hair that grew from every corner of these motor car compartments. Cars and humans are thoroughly entwined in this novel and film. Unfortunately, Cronenberg has taken the ideas, the ideas in the book literally and represents the conflagration of humans and machines in an obvious fashion. The deployment of imminent materialism requires innovation and extension from the literal representation of ideas. The analysis of everyday life is well served by the novel, as the libidinal intent is presented without emotion and in a non-interpretive manner. In Deleuze Guattari's terms, Cronenberg has ignored the tenets of the body without organs and the practices necessary to create a work of art that successfully deals with desire in a non-representative fashion. The film version of Crash presents a stylized version of libidinal charism without the satire and irony required to make the ideas gel. Rather, the film wallows in pornography and does not allow the material flows of sexualized action to circulate. The car crash therefore represents an analogy with orgasm in the film and not the multi-dimensional time images that additively combine cars, sex, desire and death. The moment of impact in the film version of Crash is limited through the filmic processes and cinematic effective devices. For example, the crescendos of music, shot choices, lighting, dialogue and the interpretive screenplay. The moment of impact between flesh and machine is spread out and multiple in the novel in order to create a plane of imminence and a means to understanding libidinal charism as reciprocating, thus involving the reader in the action as a participant. As such, libidinal charism transmutes and crosses over into everyday life and may be understood as an important principle of the Petro citizen. The exact political positioning of the Petro citizen is a convoluted and reflexive construction. This is in line with the politics of imminent materialism, which takes relevant political movements and follows the material flows that these movements present, in this case to aid in the, with the analysis of everyday life and the Petro citizen. For example, the global liberal market economics of the present situation flows through the pet Petro citizen as the connection to capital cars, petrol consumption and the products of oil is imminent to everyday life. With this in mind, oil is an ineluctable mirage and break on any form of lasting political innovation. The petrol politics of everyday life sits behind the instances that one may present to sustain the thesis of the petro citizen as a shadow or oily smudge on the clarity of the concepts involved. This is especially pertinent with respect to the political analysis of the situation. The immense wealth that oil produces encourages lies, deception and the artificial positioning of power elites interested in the capital flows of oil 
yet pretending to side with green solutions to environmental problems. Most politicians still vote for more road construction, the investment and jobs of car factories, and the diplomatic appeasement of oil-producing nations. The result, in terms of politics, is a shady plateau, which we have turned as the petro-citizen, and this is an expanded version of subjectivity that fully embraces the conglomerations of oil in everyday life. The petro-citizen, as an individual or group, may choose to ethically oppose many of the consequences of the global domination of oil, yet this is not enough to stem the tide of the invasion of the plateau by the petro-citizen. The machinery within which we now live encourages domestication and subjugation to capital flows that are connected to oil production. This process of invasion by the petro-citizen has a plethora of diverse strategies at hand, which cannot be straightforwardly calculated or quantified, but define an indeterminate mutational thesis and rolling plane of eminence. This immense multiplicity of factors is in complete opposition to the harshness of, of determinism, into which, by breaking it down into endless action and reaction, it, i.e. imminent materialism, produces, introduces cleavage and discord at every turn. This is why one needs to accept the tenets of imminent materialism to understand how the petro-citizen functions. Imminent materialism has an aleatory structure, which one may understand with reference to concepts such as the machinic phylum. The machinic phylum demonstrates how the organic and the inorganic create series and permutations according to imminent materialism. And it, in the case of this paper, these series populate everyday life and the petro-citizen. The petro-citizen is subject to evolution, yet this evolution is accelerated and mutated through the petro-political influence of oil. The organic and the inorganic work together in the formation of petro-citizens, and this formation is a chequered flag in terms of drawing one forward to understand everyday life. The concept of libidinal charism moves one in time on the plateau of the petro citizen and towards the chequered flag yet this time is itself constructed as a vital time image and is therefore subject to the analysis of everyday life that we are performing the analysis of everyday life is therefore always a double movement one understands more about every life through the application of materialism to the plateau of the petro citizen however there are always elements within the analysis that sit across from and through the plane of eminence, and therefore escape immediate attention. One therefore enters in, into a form of reciprocal ontogenesis with respect to constructing the plane of the petro-citizen and in gaining knowledge about everyday life. This is a process of individuation as described by Simondon. Individuation does not only produce the individual. One ought not to skip quickly over the step of individuation in order to arrive at that last reality that is the individual. One ought to try to know the ontogenesis of the entire development of that reality and get to know the individual in terms of individuation rather than individuation in terms of the individual. The individual or group that one may understand as the petro-citizen includes an intense process of individuation or onto ontogenesis. This is a layered checkered flag that is drawing our civilization forward below and through the plateau of the petro-citizen. This level of connection includes decay, vitalism, virality, speed, accelerationism and peak oil. If we're heading towards a tipping point in terms of the glo global economy and oil, it will be re registered in this sub alter level or second che checkered flag of the plateau of the petro-citizen. Deleuze, describe, Deleuze sorry, describes the relationship between the two levels of the plateau in the petro-citizen the logic of sense, where he examined the nature of series in literature and how these series relate to aleatory uh, and singular factors. Reality is formed through the reciprocation of, between series because reality is not only actual series but rather relations of reciprocal determinations between actual and ideal series through a medium they share the, the surface of changing intensities. Deleuze derived this psychoanalytic interpretation of reality from his reading of Lacan through Klein and, and how one comes to understand reality through the oscillations between different levels or strata. Deleuze used Alice in Wonderland to explain this oscillation and in our analysis of everyday life one might apply this notion of the 
to the plateau of the Petro Cilicum. Alice changes in form as she travels through the labyrinth of her mind and life. The Petro Citizen changes in form as one constructs the plane whereby the Petro Citizen may exist, including the subjectivating elements that one uh, can draw from contemporary narrative, economics and life. The construction of the Petro Citizen should not be an entrapment on the plane of oily influence, but will help to understand the ways in which, for example, art can represent reality. There is therefore a necessary oscillation between the different planes in the plateau of the Petro Citizen, the chequered flags that draw us forward to understand the Petro Citizen also knock us backwards and drop us into a pit of gooey substance. We can just as easily end up stranded on the motorway, clogged and blocked with cars, as we can find our way through the congestion and construct a Petro Citizen utopia. Imminent materialism keeps the two options open. And simultaneous, we don't have to take either road as the two levels of the Petro Citizen Plateau are working together to construct the multiple rea realities of everyday life. Plateau of the Petro Citizen forms individuals and herds that consume and exist within the context of Petro politics, and this formation now extends around the globe. One of the clearest consequences of this spread of the Petro Citizen is the consumptive practices and growth of cars in China. The longest traffic jams in the world are now in Beijing. There are chthonic relationships between the ways in which the individuation of petrol politics forms citizens and the consumptive patterning and global consequence of these drives. One might say that the traffic jams in China represent a mode of organisation that infiltrates the ways in which one might now conceive of freedom. The drives that one has to exhibit in order to consume and exist within the context of petrol politics now have to comprehend the relationship that these drives inspire around the globe. The point isn't that the citizens of China now want to merely copy the lifestyle choices of the West. The point is that the petropolitics influences the choices of the Chinese as an unremitting, unremitting drive that pushes them along to overtake the West. The consequences in terms of resource depletion and a potential environmental disaster are clear. The internal conflicts that the choices of the emerging Chinese Petro citizens will produce and are producing are more convoluted. This is because the economies of the West and China are now integrated into one global capitalist system, so that the increases in wealth and, chi in ch in wealth and China are highly connected to the fortunes of the West through global market economics. One could say that the traffic jams in China burrow through and emerge around the globe as stops and starts in apparently unrelated economic activity. One feels this connection in terms of freedom. Ah, the poor bird that felt free and now strikes the walls of the cage. Woe, when you feel homesick for the land, as if it had offered more freedom, and there is no longer any land. This is a quote from Nietzsche, who expressed the workings of imminent materialism in terms of subjectivity and freedom. Currently, the World Wide Web can be used to communicate the ideas of imminent materialism simultaneously and concurrently around the globe. The Chinese citizens can do research on American and European lifestyles and replicate these habits in their own terrain. This means that, for example, the notion of violent revolution and the overthrow of oppressive regimes can now happen through a combination of various electronically mediated and organized social media and physical rebellion which could ultimately threaten the continued predominance of the Chinese Communist Party. Within this MySpace version of the electronic agora, cybernetic communism is mainstream and unexceptional. What had once been a revolutionary dream is now an enjoyable part uh, of everyday life. This is a quote from Barbrook. The introduction of the net into the equations of the Petro citizen enables contradictory and, and foreseen contradictory and foreseen consequences in its construction. For example, a photograph in a traffic jam in Sao Paulo may be connected on the internet to an exhibition of suspended cars in Oslo, paintings of stylized car crashes in Los Angeles, and a representation of libidinal carism in Kiev. The plethora of meanings that one can extract from such multiple connectivity and a confluence of images gives rise to the creativity and artistic possibilities of imminent materialism. This is an affective movement. 
which demands innovation and a highly developed sense of conceptual construction. One is never able to fully relax and think that imminent materialism has been fully realised, as it does not represent a closed system. Rather, the forces and drives in its construction must be ceaselessly explored and developed in further works of creation. In terms of traffic jams and car crashes, we cannot rest with the physical representation of actual cars and lines of traffic and their concomitant desires. The petropolitics and use of products that, de that derive from the production of oil has created a vast array of artificial life that must be included in the analysis of everyday life. Much of this life now makes its way into the ocean and becomes part of a vast array of objects that circulate in suspension. North Pacific Gaia is a clockwise circulation of four prevailing ocean currents and is in the process of collecting pelagic plastic, non-degradable chemical sludge and other man-made debris in a huge oceanic suspension convergent north of the Hawaiian archipelago. The Gaia concentrates an estimated 100 million tonnes of visible and invisible and invisible plastic waste, waste in what has been termed the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Various estimates of the size of the patch range from Texas to the continental USA. Although most plastics break down slowly through a combination of photo uh, de degradation, oxidation and mechanical abrasion, thick plastic items persist for decades even when subject to direct sunlight and survive even longer when shielded from UV radiation underwater or in sediments. When the plastics do break down, the vast majority simply dis disassembles into ever finer microscopic fragments and eventually in assimilable molecular polymers. As such, the suspended increasingly microscopic waste builds up and is ingested by sea life, birds, fish, zooplankton, plants and other filter feeders. In recent studies, the microscopic suspension is measured to outweigh zooplankton by six times in relative mass. As such, the traffic jams and car crashes of human existence have translated into the seas. We are driving this process and our global petro-political civilization does not relent from adding to, the, to the, this mass of plastics. Imminent materialism does not give us a solution to the, this picture of ecological Armageddon it does enable an understanding of its formations. This understanding must be penetrating, both in a rational sense of contemplating the scale of the problem and in an unconscious sense of enabling creative work that can properly represent what is happening. One needs to appreciate the connection between everyday life and the most destructive production of pollution the world has ever known. The current situation requires radical and unheard of strategies and tactics to make the connection clear. I'd like to suggest that the petro-citizen, imminent materialism, petro-politics, libidinal carism and the international and time-based plateau into which the ideas of this paper fit gives us a chance to communicate such a point. In the film Falling Down, Michael Douglas gets out of his car in a traffic jam, fires a bazooka into a roadwork. His character represents a rebellion against the everyday conformity that traffic jams and car crashes can produce. We all feel this rebellion ebb and flow in us as we watch the spectacle from our cars stuck in traffic jams. Yet the act of getting out of such cars and abandoning every day life is anticipated for us through the regimes of economics in which we are enmeshed. How will we pay off the mortgage if we don't go to work by car? What is the future of society if we stay in our homes or only operate on foot? Of course, the non-use of cars or our electric cars is currently not possible unless the means to work from home through thoroughly through networked jobs is realised and everything that we do is reorganised accordingly. Until that time in future history, we are consigned to live the lives of commuters and the petropolitics that seeps into everything that we can understand about social organisation. Michael Douglas's character represents a hero type that we cannot emulate. Yet his drives are exemplary and define certain qualities of the petro citizen that we might want to follow. We need to stand up and say that there are more important issues than cars and crashes and traffic jams. These issues constitute survival narratives and escape routes from the plateau of the petro citizen. We must resist the endless depletion of planetary resources without reciprocation. This stopping point is a break from the past 
and involves the idealism of ecological mythology joined to pragmatic and sustainable ways to transform society and habit. I hope that imminent materialism could be part of this solution as it includes the recognition that art has a vital role to play in changing everyday life. Populations have been turned into packs of consumers through the economic and governmental processes of the last 25 years. And everything we consume depends in some way on petrol. The thought of traffic jams sits inside of us and creates emotional responses to events, some of which we may be barely aware. These responses and sentiments to everyday life are aligned with Deleuze and Guattari's rhizomatics, with pipelines of global capital that have increased its accessibility and proliferation of petrol with subjectivity. The wealth that is being created due to petrol consumption is reinvested in everyday life as parallel and alternate forms of economic activity. The economy is therefore driven and accelerated by petrol and the many other products through political economics. The idea of everyday life in this paper is henceforth diverted from the structural critique of objective sociology that Henry Lefebvre enacted and aligned with the practice of everyday life as described by Michel de Sauture. Sauture famously stated, in order to become embroiled within the practices of everyday life, one should walk around urban areas. And this strategy has resonance within this paper about traffic jams and everyday life as this tactic predominantly relieves one of car travel. So Chia's practice of thinking about embedded narratives through walking, through walking enables the tactics and strategies of everyday life to come to the fore, and these ideas joined well with Deleuze Guattari's effective politics as represented in A Thousand Plateau. Everyday life in this paper is a form of reflexive, affective politics. This politics includes art, non-organic life and thinking through the elements of contemporary existence until one begins to discern the plateau of everyday life as an on-current reciprocating reality and a potential maelstrom of non-human becomings. I have termed this ingrained and fluvial reality as the petro-citizen. We are all petro-citizens. This statement is true even if we reject the everyday use of cars or if we believe in a green solution to impending environmental catastrophe. The, the petro-citizen is not a negative assessment with respect to everyday life, but is a fitting term that sums up some of the most vital elements of becoming involved with everyday life. Everyday Life Through the Imminent Materialism of Deleuze and Guattari by David Robert Cole What is everyday life? The singularity within this question, by degrees this paper, is formed by the conjunction of often simultaneous subjective narrative structures that allow one to explain everyday life in terms of events and occurrences in sequence and the particular objective historical context that one finds oneself embroiled within. And this aspect of everyday life is foregrounded by and the oil that we use, for example, plastics. George Bush said we are addicted to oil. This is an underestimation of the connection between subjectivity and oil. The microdynamics of traffic combined with the macro politics of oil is more than an addiction. This more than may be understood through the ways in which the reality of traffic jams transmutes into different behaviours and planes that intersect with and manifest in everyday life. For example, the drive to and from work intersects with feelings of powerlessness, frustration and inability to change circumstances, which is conjunctive with road expansion, car production, satellite towns and the car parks of shopping malls. The petro-citizen dutifully consumes petrol 
by buying their food at the supermarket. They ingest the 